All right, Isaac, I want to welcome you to the show today. Thanks for having me, Bill. It's great to be here. Well, I'm really excited to have you on. I uh, uh, it, I think we've got a robust conversation that we're going to have today. And I just want I'll just introduce you to to our listeners because I want our listeners to know uh, who I'm talking with today because it's it's uh, super important. So I'm talking to Isaac um, Sakolik. Am I pronouncing your name correctly? It's actually Sakolik, but Sakolik. Okay, I, I, I accept all forms of uh, how you pronounce my name. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so Isaac Sakolik, and he is the founder and president of Star CIO, a technology learning company that focuses on digital transformation. Um, and you've also been, which I found really fascinating. We're going to talk about this. Your role as a CTO early in your career, and also um, a tran- uh, a CIO leading transformation initiatives with with enterprises. And you founded Star CIO with the belief that agile ways of working and data driven practices can empower diverse teams to drive in for, uh, transformation. And that's what I, I want to cover is is how you t- took that startup mentality and deploy that into the enterprise. No, no easy task. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're you're a writer and a keynote speaker and author of the bestseller Driving Di- Driving Digital: The Leader's Guide to Business Transformation Through Technology. And Driving Digital is. Uh, your is your first uh, book. And then I'm going to be referencing Digital Trailblazer, which uh, we're going to be talking about today. You're a frequent contributor to InfoWorld and CIO.com, where you write about digital transformation, agile management, and other technology and leadership topics. And also, I was, I was really impressed that you have uh, have over 800 articles, probably more than that now, that you have on your blog since 2005. So you were early to the blog, the blogging world. And I was. And you've spoken at over what over 150 different conferences, and that's probably more uh, than that right now too. It's uh, 950 some odd articles that I've written, and every year it's somewhere between 50 and 60 uh, in person and virtual events. I love sharing and meeting people, and that's how I started blogging. I mean, somebody came to me and said, "Isaac, your startup is got some great social media." social networking functionality, but it's not plugged into the blogosphere. And I was like, oh, what are they asking me to do? And I did some research and like, oh, they're asking me to write a blog, which I was completely wrong about. Um, This was in 2005. They were actually talking about creating an ecosystem of of social networks that their startup was trying to create. But I started blogging in 2005. And uh, I just said, you know what, whenever I figure something out that I think will be useful to people, I'll just put it up on the blog. And uh, my first blog post of all things was my very first blog post was about logging, how oh, to write logging. a good, how to write a great log file so that people can understand and, you know, do root cause analysis and find problems. And here we are 20 years later talking about observability and the importance of creating a uh, uh, applications that are robust and easy to resolve issues around. So, you know, we change the names and the technologies, but some of the issues that we're dealing with, they don't change. It just get more sophisticated. Well, and and maybe we can also start, I'd love to, love to find out about where kind of what your your arc and your journey has been, because I see right behind you is the a book on neural networks. And I think uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you could talk a little bit, uh, you were into machine learning and, and neural networks back in the two, early 2000s or so, right? Back in earlier. In, oh my gosh. You were there before it was actually a real thing, right? Yeah. If I, if I know, knew what I know now about artificial intelligence, this was back in 1995 when I graduated the university of Arizona and we were programming neural networks by hand, you know, here's a neuron and here's a layer of the network and here's your feed forward algorithm and here's your feedback algorithm. And you'd like go and program this thing and say, okay, let's do some computer vision on some medical imaging, which is what I was studying at the time. And you would set the thing to go and you'd go have some beers with your friends, come back the next day and, uh, uh, you know, when Rodney Dangerfield had this movie, it's like the answer is four. Uh, I think it's either it's it, I, that was actually a Douglas Adams reference, but he comes up with the answer. You forget what the question was, right? And you're looking at this this result and saying, now what do I do? Uh, and so that was neural networks back in the '90s. We had no algorithms. There was no TensorFlow. There was no cloud. It was all very slow. And uh, but we were trying to solve some really interesting things around computer vision, around predictions, a little bit of natural language processing. I actually built uh, over, I think it was about six or seven different 
AI products in my startup uh, days and even in going into my CIO days. So if I knew what I knew that then, I probably would have stayed the data science route instead of becoming a CIO and uh, opening a company. I probably might have been doing some interesting things. I do a lot of advisory now with startups um, around uh, artificial intelligence, and it's it's an exciting area. And we I was talking to you earlier how important it is to think about transformation as a core competency. You know, three years ago. Uh, we went from growth to resolving a pandemic set of issues to supply chain issues to hybrid wor- uh, working issues. So, you know, we did this huge pivot in 2020 uh, that I talk about in chapter 20, 10 of the book. And now I think we're on the cusp of another major inflection with artificial intelligence uh, that I've been talking about this. Um, what's the impact of generative AI from both an opportunity and a risk perspective? And I think uh, my post this morning is four five different ways CIOs have to prepare uh, for, the, uh, for generative AI. I and chat GPT coming into their organizations. Uh, It's just tons of activity in the AI space that's going to lead to how organizations are transforming. Oh, uh, well, that happens to be what our innovation mastermind was. We had 100 100 CIOs on last week talking about uh, chat GPT. So I was introducing them to uh, really what what are the best, what are the ways that you can have uh, private AI within your organization versus public AI? What are the governance and security around that and the challenges? And it's, it was fascinating to see how many folks really hadn't, uh, hadn't really uh, dove into it yet and really hadn't experimented. But I'm so glad we're talking about this because um, I, I just think that this is a complete game changer for businesses and, a, and perfect for the role of the, the CTO or CIO moving forward. What do you, do you, do you agree? Well, I, uh, one of the, pieces of advice I left in the blog post, and I spoke to uh, the National Association of Corporate Directors last week, and I said, look, we need to look at the horizons uh, and the frequency we do blue sky thinking and innovation planning, and whatever that frequency was before, probably double it, because it, it, things are just happening too fast. And what we thought was science fiction, you know, a year ago, I mean, chat GPT wasn't on anybody's radar a year ago, it didn't exist really a year ago. And now, you know, marketing departments are going to be the really the first group hit with a whole set of point solutions that can help them generate graphics and generate videos and generate content. But, you know, I've asked ChatGPT for policies that I've used in IT. I've used it to do research for my articles. It's, you know, sent me code snippets. I haven't coded in ages, but I was like, let me throw it at this simple problem. You know, we have two columns of names and I have to join the names from two different databases with no key. Um, How do I do this? And it came back and said, use this library in Python. Here's some code snippet to use it. I was like, holy cow, even I can do this now. Yeah, I I just finished an innovation conference last week and and they're highly, uh, the way that the the industry is thinking is that... Potentially, we the role of the developer within five years will be very, very different than it than it is today. Because, and even ideation, like folks were saying, you know, uh, what about in your boardroom having Chat G- GPT up live while you're ideating at the board level? I mean, that idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look. One of the things I say is you do not want to share intellectual property with Chat GPT. I mean, there's, you know, they're capturing your data. Um, and you're not sure how they're using it, but your developers, you know, look, we had always a hard time of getting developers to go read other people's code and to go research open source libraries and understand, you know, how to leverage, you know, I got a starting point here. I'm always going to ask my developers, what did you research first before you start coding anything because Mm -hmm. it's now got like a Star Trek like interface, you know, ask it a question. It's giving you that answer. Just like in in the 1960s Star Trek episodes. Yeah. I was listening to Elon Musk talk about it last week and it was interesting. Um, You know, in windows 95 and the browser wars back in the day, that was like the first real interface from kind of general human beings be able to use the internet without a, a set of technical skills it seems to me that ChatGPT and, and Microsoft's investment is, is sort of like the first interface that is real practical for human beings to use. Yeah, we're going to have to see how that plays out, especially with Copilot. I think that's going to be one of the more interesting things that changes how people work. We talk about future of work. 
And now I can ask questions and not have to have all that expertise to program a, uh, a, a an Excel formula or create a pivot table, or you know, I'm not going to have a designer rebuild my my PowerPoint. It's going to create it for me. I mean, these are you know, we're going to think of very differently. You think about you walked into your travel agent and they're sitting there keying and keying and keying into the green screens. And then now we're mouse clicking and mouse clicking. And you're like, now it's going to be very different. The interface is different and the results that we're getting back. And I have a lot of questions around it. Like when I do this in chat GPT, I don't get my content isn't referenced. I have a problem with that. You know, I don't know where yeah. to go research next. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see, you know, where the big three now, maybe four, are going to start making their AI explainable or, you know, are we going to put regulations in place around that or, you know, are companies going to firewall off this capability because they're afraid of IP being leaked out to it? It'll be very interesting to see how it plays out in the next 12 months. Yeah, someone someone said uh, it's it's uh, shadow AI. You know, we had shadow uh, shadow IT is going to be shadow AI that we're going to have had, to go govern and secure. <laughs> I had an exact statement around that in my blog, and I said, look, if you don't say anything to your employees, they're going to see a green light there, and they're not sure. going to know where to stop in terms of what they're doing, what they should and shouldn't do there, because you haven't provided some guidelines around that. Sure. Um, so I think you know if you know bias and ethics and proper use of AI was like somewhere down in the list of priorities for a lot of organizations. I think they really need to ratchet it up now. So let's go back to the, to your college days. And, and so did, did you, and, and just let's get a, a, like a trajectory of, of where, how you ended up as a CIO and kind of where you started and, and uh, to where you are today, if you could, if, so you went to Arizona state. University of Arizona, Tucson, University. Arizona. Okay. And uh, and then, so you, you, what was your degree in there? Uh, I got my master's in electrical engineering. Um, I graduated my bachelor's from Binghamton during a recession. And, uh, you know, the career pathing back in those days was uh, terrible. I mean, you know, they kind of looked at it as, you know, your journey ends when you give you get your piece of paper and there's a little bit of career development. Um, but I said, you know what, I'm having too fun, too much fun with this engineering thing. I really like signal processing. Binghamton, uh, very cloudy, cold area. And I got a nice uh, um, teaching assistantship that became a graduate assistantship over at University of Arizona. And then I got there and I said, well, what kind of problems do I want to solve? You know, signal processing, even back then, was a pretty broad area. And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of want to do some good things here. I want to try to do things that are practical. And um, that led me into signal processing in the areas of medical imaging. It's funny because I, I drive by the university now. Uh, because my son goes there. Even though I'm a, a New Yorker, my son ended up at the <laughs> University of Arizona. He's studying aerospace engineering. But wow. the, bil the billboard that had the sign saying, looking for EE student, computer vision, machine intelligence, I think it was called at the time, or systems engineering, finish up some grad work for a radiological um, uh, 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 optical scientist program. And I grabbed it off and I said, I'm taking this one. <laughs> and that, that billboard is still there. Oh, <laughs> still really? Hanging out there 30 years <laughs> later or whatever it is. Yeah. So that's how I got into it. And, uh, I just kept on going into these, um, you know, neural networks. You see, that's the actual book we studied for. Um, I had a machine intelligence course, uh, an information architecture, uh, information theory class. And a lot of the courses back then were very um, theoretical based and mathematically based, um, trying to get into the application based. And uh, my first job out of school was uh, coming back here to Long Island of all places. And uh, um, uh, I answered an ad that said, we need somebody who knows computer vision in the bio, um, biomedical, uh, physical sciences space. And I was like, you know, I told my girlfriend at the time, she was, she's my wife now. And I told her, you know what? Um, you circled the best classified ad that I could ever respond to in the New York area because I'm kind of perfect for that job. I got that job, moved out there, did image processing for two years, and then the internet blew up. And uh, so that was roughly 90, 95, 90, 90, 96, 97. 97. And okay. 
And uh, I was a little bit of a go-getter in my young days. And I saw this job and was, uh, I started looking at uh, internet oriented jobs and took an interview and the CTO said to me, Isaac, uh, we're going to be pulling in unstructured data from newspapers that we want to make searchable um, and build an entire platform for the newspaper online. Um, how would you solve the ability to suck in all this information from newspapers in various formats and uh, make it all searchable. And that was kind of the first startup I joined was doing oh, wow. that. Uh, we were credited in the Wall Street Journal for being one of the first ASPs. We now call them SAS. Um, and uh, we we lived through the dot-com uh, bubble. We ended up uh, acquiring a bunch of companies. We ended up consolidating a lot of things after that. Uh, but we were a hosting provider for applications a provider for newspapers. And I tell people um, that's where I really learned transformation. We were looking at an industry that went through massive disruption. You know, before that, for those of you who do not know, if you were looking for a job or a car or a house or an apartment, or you were selling one, you were doing that in a newspaper and this thing called a classified ad that you probably paid between a hundred and a thousand dollars for, uh, uh, pre-inflation and you got this four or five line ad that you squeezed as much information into it and it showed up on a page with thousands of these things yep. that was sitting behind a call center taking thousands of these things and uh, you know the advertising revenue of a newspaper is 85 percent of their revenue is a multi-billion dollar industry disrupted by you know first craigslist and ebay right and cars.com and hot jobs and monster and then later on facebook's and google's i mean they went through rounds of disruption and uh you know, I got to see that front front row and seat with my board. Um, I told one of those boards board stories at the first chapter of Digital Trailblazer. That was a that was an ad one story, and uh, sitting in uh, the boardroom at uh, at a very famous publisher, um, answering quest technical questions to them. How do you answer a technical question to the board without throwing in five or six other layers of jargon that they're not going to understand? Um, and I remember playing it out in my head. How am I going to answer this thing? Um, and that's what you see in the book in the first chapter. But that that was my sort of college to start up years. And and then when when did the first uh, when did it did you take on your first enterprise or your first business CIO position? Like when did it did you go right in from startup into the into the uh, in the business world? Yeah, I, st the I did startups for about ten years. Okay. Um, in New York. And my last one was a ground floor travel social network. Love the product, love the idea, love the business model, but it's very hard to get social networks off the ground. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, that was a, a, a lesson learned in the end. But uh, one of the things I learned, we were one of the first few startups to take series AVC money uh, when they were starting to compete with angels. And uh, I think that worked in a San Francisco West Coast ecosystem. It was very hard to pull off in a New York ecosystem uh, where they still expected us to have full you know, management board readouts every single month. We were a startup with a million dollars in funding. So you can see the math didn't work out well for us. And uh, I said, you know what, if I'm going to do, this was 2005, if I'm going to continue doing startups, I better move to California because it's not going to work in New York for a long period of time. And yeah. for a lot of reasons, I couldn't do it. So I said, well, I better find something else to do, because if startups aren't going to work in New York, I better find something else to do. And that's how I got hired at McGraw-Hill at the time. And they said, Isaac, we want you to bring startup-like practices and figure out how to make them work in the enterprise. And my first job with them was at Business Week magazine, another publisher. Um, but I ended up becoming a CIO there and then a CIO at a construction data company uh, that they own that's now, um, they sold it off, is now called Dodge Data and Analytics. Um, and then I became the CIO over in financial services at a company called Greenwich Associates that's now owned by s and um, Okay. So 10 years of being CIO in companies that were trying to figure out um, how to use data and analytics to a strategic advantage and involve their products considerably from what they were doing before. Uh, construction was best known as, an, as basically a job board for 
general contractors to bid on projects. And most of that wasn't happening by the time I got there. We ended up building uh, several analytics and app and uh, mobile products, very specialized to different personas, growing our data out. Um, that's essentially what led to that divestiture um, and getting owned by a different group to help them scale that. And then at Greenwich Associates, we're doing it market research against banks um, and figuring out how do you take a process and modernize it, put self-service analytics off of it, give access to uh, uh, banking customers, their analytics through APIs and things like that to get access to their data. So uh, really revolutionizing the products and services that uh, they were doing. And this was all about, you know, how do you take an existing business and say, where does it need to be over the next three to four years? Are we going to be able to continue yeah. serving the same products uh, for that period of time? And do we even want to be say, serving the same customers, the same oriented um, models that we're doing right now? So it really required changing everything about what we're doing. Now, one of the chapters on on data is uh, is about bad bad data, buried in bad and, data. Yeah, yeah, and buried and and I'm, a couple of questions because you have a unique skill set in data and analytics. And what happens to the CIO who doesn't? doesn't have that deep of a, of a, of a skill set personally with, with data. Like maybe you can just explain that as far as, as, as where you think the, the, as the role of the transformation leader is uh, as it moves forward. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I used to say that CIOs knew more about the boxes that hosted the data than the data <laughs> itself. And, you know, now you start talking, you know, whatever buzzword you want to use, the data-driven organization or citizen development or data governance, and you start getting into a playing field that uh, they don't know a whole lot about. And I think a lot's changed in the last 10 years, 15 years, I think. CIOs um, learned to be, to build up their strengths and build up their vocabulary and understand the analytics space a little bit better. I think a lot of that's happened. Um, I think there's a new generation of IT data and experience leaders that are coming through. I think I was one of the first generations of CTO, CIOs coming through that probably knew more about applications and data and user experience even more than I understood about infrastructure and governance. Mm. I kind of picked that up later. I think there's a lot more people getting balance around that. And, you know, the reality is, is that uh, whatever we come in from our backgrounds, right, when we become CIOs or we have people on our teams that might become CIOs later on, we come in from a single or maybe two lanes of understanding. You know, I uh, yeah. was head of applications, I understand Agile, I understand DevOps. I was head of IT service management, I understand incident management, I understand end user computing. You know, I'm a data scientist, you know, maybe I understand a little bit about data governance. So we sort of understand this lane. And so I think the biggest challenge for CIOs is um, expanding their own capabilities by hiring lieutenants who are highly versatile, yeah. who are two-way learners, so they can you know, they can educate but also continue to learn. And I think that same process applies to uh, to CIOs that must be uh, continuously learning because the technology is changing so much. And that was really the impetus for writing Digital Trailblazer, knowing that it wasn't just practices that were important. Driving Digital talked a lot about agile and proactive data governance and data science and product management capabilities and how to change the culture. So it was a very process oriented book. Digital Trailblazer is a book of stories so that when you're facing uh, a, a, an issue, an opportunity for the first time, you've never had a blow up moment. Uh, a shock and awe moment. You've never stood in front of the board before. You never had to convince an executive group to go and do um, a, an investment in an area that they don't necessarily want to do. You know, I just tell my stories of how I handled it. And Bill, you know this, not all of them are glory, happy ending stories. There's some no. really difficult stories in there that I tell. One, one of my one of my favorite is uh, you're pretty pretty honest about the different uh, going into a boardroom or even just going into a leadership team meeting. And, and you talk about, you know, you walking in there, which percentage of the folks that are in there um, 
ag uh, agree with you or are going to be on your side, which ones are going to be uh, take take shots at you, and then which which percentage of that audience doesn't really care, you know, and then who actually is going to take ownership, who wants to own the problem uh, yeah. versus those that. And who just doesn't want to do work? <laughs> and yeah. I found that I found that pretty that's uh, I found that that pretty fascinating um, because I'm sure everybody can can um, can relate to that. I think everybody can relate to it. I think honestly, as a profession, we struggle with it, you know. And you know, I tell like a very um, more technical version of that story, I'm trying to explain to a CEO why our ETL is always failing um, and the complexities around that. And to be able to tell that story, uh, I sat with the developer and I understood what the problems were. I had him print a lot of paper this thick. I kid you not. It was this thick of all the ETLs and all the transformations in the databases. And I brought it to our next uh, uh, management meeting saying, you know, it's going to take me a little bit of time to figure out what all the problems are in here. This is not a simple answer that I can answer for you in a couple of days. And, you know, and that's a, that was a very tactical situation. And that's, I think it's just the next chapter, one of the next chapters. I tell the story of bringing product management to our executive team. And, you know, people like the idea of, of products until you really have that conversation around, you know, product management isn't about taking everybody's wish list and coming up with a shiny object that checks all the boxes. It's about trade-offs. And in fact, you know, all the executives sitting in the room that um, think they know what all the right answers are, you know, they have a narrow lens on what the right answers are. They have a strategic lens on right all the answers are, but I need to go talk to customers. You know, I need to go see how they're going to use the technology, what their pain points are, what their value is. And if you think this is just a SaaS company, you can translate this to supply chain issues. You could, you know, I do, you know, you could, you could, you could translate this to patient experience um, and how technologists and hospitals have to service patients differently and doctors differently. Um, I did some talks last year with um, higher ed and I said, you know, if, if, COVID and the pandemic wasn't a wake-up call in higher ed, it, it, it better be because more people are finding ways to get higher ed education without having a college experience and without putting those bills for a college experience. So when you see alternatives, when you see new experiences coming in play and challenges to the cost and business models to the incumbent, that's what disruption is. Right. And you throw in new technology in the mix of this, and that's the accelerant. Right. And that's what people are seeing today. Yeah. And I think that 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 chapter is chapter nine and it's called yep. Sell, selling innovation to the C-suite and reducing stress. Yeah. And uh, and it right support. And you, I love this part. Support is an interesting word. This is in quotes. Just getting an executive support in a conference room only amounts to their decision not to confront you in that room. Uh, yeah. you know, however, if you want the executive to follow up and follow through, you got to go, you know, way beyond that. Um, you know, I think it's, but part of it is, seems to me almost like ma managing emotions, managing emotions of others, like how, how affected uh, the CIO is with a variety of different people that are going to be in there um, in the role of sales. What do you think, what percentage of the, of uh, CIO's job do you think is actually we can call it sales. We can call it influence. We can call it getting people's, you know, on on board with your idea. What percentage do you think is is that? I know the answer to this because I've done the the research on this and I okay. talk about it. It's somewhere between forty and seventy percent. Okay. Right? If you think about, you know, the the track that CIOs have had, and you know, put in chief data officers, put in chief security officers, we've come in from the operating world. Right. And now we're trying to influence strategy. We're trying to influence experience, both customer and employee experience. But we understand at that level, the nuts and bolts. So what do you do when you understand the nuts and bolts, but you really under need to understand the customer? You got to go out and sit with customers. Yeah. Right. You got to understand their vantage point. You got to get on a plane and see how they're using your products and services and understand their pain points through a technology lens. And then you need to spend your time with your executives, right? How do you figure out how a salesperson is being incentive? Well, mm. some of that 
gets documented and sometimes it's very public and sometimes it's not, but you need to go have some conversations. How am I going to help you in your journey and what parts of your journey am I going to have to go and maybe combat the status quo on? Do I know what that is? How do I learn what my impediments are, where my detraction is going to come? I got to spend a ton of my time doing those things. Right. And we don't come in with sales skill sets. Many of us are introverts. Uh, we don't know how to necessarily market what we're trying to sell. That's why it's taken so long to sell technology or sell security. And is because we come in with the solution instead of with the value and the problem. Right. That's sales and marketing. So we're spending yeah. a ton of our time doing that. You know, yeah, and sales is really sales is, is really about listening. It's more than anything. It's a it's a it's a listening process. Um and working people through as, um, uh, yeah, I mean, but I guess maybe sales gets a bad a bad rap because we don't think of it. We think of it from just presenting a solution, not really the um, listening. But the best salespeople don't sell you a solution. CIOs know this. The best salespeople come in and say, okay, I understand what your problem is. You know, let me connect you with people who have had similar problems. Let me show you um, what the outcome of a solution looks like if you implement the solution. Like that, we're not, best salespeople aren't selling, they're developing relationships and they're um, explaining the value, their value add in terms of a partnership. <laughs> Now you have a you have a big part of this talking about vision and um and the and the refinement of vision. Do you do you find in your research and in in the different roles that, that you've had and in, in working with your company now that 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 is something that a CIO needs to work on to develop their own vision for or or do they just need to understand the corporate vision? Like what maybe you can explain that a little bit. Yeah, let me get a little bit tactical with you here. Okay. I mean, um, I think more about um, two groups of people, when I use the word vision, I think about people we call stakeholders. Um, those are the ones who have a vested interest in the outcomes of uh, an innovation, uh, an initiative that we're working on. Um, and so they're going to have some way of expressing their requirements to us, what their priorities are. And then I think about the teams, right? The teams that are working on this um, and trying to solve problems uh, around it. Um, I know that um, that my goals are going to evolve. Um, they're not going to stay static. Um, and I need a way of communicating. Are we aligned in terms of what direction that we're heading in? And can I create an alignment with something that's very lightweight, very easy to write, very easy to consume? Because I don't have time to go build 25-page decks get them through approval processes, and then expect my team to understand this. I, I write, talk about that in chapter yep. four of the book. You know, two presentations, you know, about 20 pages of decks to get a half a million dollar investment. I'm like, that just doesn't work anymore. And so I didn't realize this was a problem until I started walking into companies and I started asking the developers mostly and the data scientists, what problem are you trying to solve for? And I'd get a technical answer. And so I'd say, okay, who are you doing this for? Who's the, who's the person's going to benefit when you solve this problem? And they'd say something like the enterprises. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, the enterprise is 15,000 people. Like who in the enterprise? Oh, it's the finance department that's going to benefit. Well, there's 400 people in the finance department. What are we talking about here? Who's the real customer here? And it took that kind of questioning to get alignment around it. And then you've seen this before. This is a, a play, you know, you bring in the, architect and the head of, you know, people leading the initiative, and you bring the stakeholders in and say, you know, tell me the five things that this initiative has to deliver, what's going to be the real value. And you've just gotten two completely different answers from two groups of people. And even worse mm -hmm. is when you have multiple stakeholders, you probably got four dialects of the same problem uh, mm -hmm. from their own vantage point. So yeah, I think vision is really our lightweight expression of how do we define a North Star? What are we really okay. after here? And honestly, I don't take on initiatives without that. If we can't get an agreement over what our goal is, I have no idea what the cost or complexity is around that. I got to go figure that out. But I need to make sure we have the same vision of what we're going after, um, that we can express what the outcomes are. Uh, and the outcomes are worthy of putting a team against it, right? Worthy of figuring out 
that vision into a problem statement, into a plan, into execution. Once I have that, then I know I can do the rest of it. So you're, so you, um, and you believe that the CIO can lead that fundamentally or, or not so much. First chapter, my first book. And I say, (laughs) um, that's, that's what's expected of a CIO today. Okay. One, one way or another. Okay. Um, you know, any single solution area, any single technology has a bunch of labels underneath it to get sorted through a lot of choices, a lot of compliance factors, um, multiple vendors coming in, selling all kinds of widgets around that. And, you know, absent of somebody who can help connect the dots there, what does the, what, what does the business person do? They yeah. sign a check. It's still the right. position that connects all the dots. It's the one. Yeah. It's the one. It's the one position that connects all the dots. It, it always has been, but the, you know, the level by which we're connecting dots is no longer a three-tiered application living on a couple servers, right? We're getting into how the business is operating. We're getting into you know trade-offs in terms of, you know, do I want to you release something with more innovation, take on more risk, or do I want to take on more security and compliance up front? You know, mm-hmm. and those kinds of trade-offs are, are not black and white. There's some decisions that need to be made depending on what you're trying to release. I, I use the word safety as a factor here, right? For me, the opposite of innovation in some ways is safety, right? Mm-hmm. If I need to be more secure, more safe, there's human factors involved here. There's brand risk involved. There's um, uh, regulation involved. I'm going to have to, you know, kind of weigh on that side a little bit early before I start thinking through end user experience and data and analytics and machine learning capabilities. That's a, you had a great story. Uh, for those who have, who pick up the book, I highly recommend it. This story is fun. It's it. I think it was one of your first uh, jobs after being a CTO. So you're you're used to moving at the speed of light, you know, and not having a bunch of friction around you know decisions. And you come smack into a, a really uh, a very traditional organization with a lot yeah. of you know multiple powerpoints and committees needed for decisions, and it was just uh, it was interesting reading how you had to navigate that. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you've been a CIO around long enough, you're going to get a good laugh out of my first three or four chapters. Uh, most common thing I hear from um, uh, executives who've been through the last 20 you know years of, of running technologies like yeah we brought you brought back so many good stories from me I lived through this one or that one uh, for the for, for those who are you know trailblazers the ones who are younger in their career um, you know they're getting real lessons out of it they've never been through some of these um, sure trials sure. And by the way, you know, like um, a lot of the reading, a lot of the writing, you know, talk about CEOs sitting at, at, on the plane reading something. They're reading about it from the, you know, the big tech company, the startup mentality, the ones that really can run 70, 80, 90 miles per hour. And then even if you get rid of all, a lot of the bureaucracy, we still have a lot of technical debt. Okay, we still have a lot of systems that we need to integrate. Uh, We have a lot of people that we have to do change management around. And, you know, this isn't the same kind of friction I was living with in terms of decision making. This is about how do we use technologies and business process, you know, to our advantage so that we can continue to do these things. Um, Maybe not as fast as a, a startup, but at least the speed that my organization can run with. Well, Uh, so when I think it's great. Well, the thing is, is that I think you need a vision for your career and for the role and the position and the speed of which we're changing. What that's what I like is that, you know, you're you're saying a trailblazer is like uh, I just read this book, 1776. It's about the early trailblazers of mm. the settlers uh, uh, hitting Fort Pitt and moving west. Mm. It was nothing easy about that. It was it was brutal, brutal for the Indians and brutal for the settlers and. Um, and so it's interesting, but like, uh, a, a, if someone doesn't want to be a trailblazer, they probably shouldn't read the book. But this is like the stories of of the reality of, and that's what I like is you got to have a vision, you got to envision yourself in the future, and that's what I think you're setting up here, which is fun. Yeah, look, um, this is not 1776, and we're not, you know, going through you know jungles of areas and hurting people and what have you, but. 
you know, this isn't an area where there's a predefined playbook, right? Really, that's the, the, the point of those early stories is that you're always going to be looking at how your organization's operating and saying, you know what, I got to do things differently. You know, the world is changing in some fundamental way. And I've, you know, whether it's changing belief systems, mindsets, incentives, practices, I mean, that's what's the most interesting thing that's, you know, bringing it back to the AI story. Um, I wrote a post two, three years ago that said AI would never learn to code. <laughs> you can go running through my 900 posts, you'll find it. And I don't, I, I honestly think AI isn't coding yet. AI is finding coding examples and using those patterns to assemble a solution for you, you know, somewhere in that, you know, 400 lines of code range or not, yep. you know, for anyone who's a developer out there, they're still going to be developing solutions for a long period of time. Um, but my tools of doing this have changed dramatically. Yeah. You know, my ways of doing it are, are, have changed dramatically. I mean, when the steam shovel, the way I look at it is that when the steam shovel was invented, the people who used shovels were probably bummed out. You know, they're like, I just want to shovel the rest of my life. But the reality is when you're working near a um, uh, uh, electrical line or you're working near some conduit line underground, you can't use a massive steam shovel. You're going to have to take out, you know, a small shovel. And so, but I think the type of work we do now, we just have to reimagine, you know, what is the work of a human? I look at it as just a, a huge digital assistant. And where are we going to use those digital assistants uh, most powerfully? Yeah. I have a question. I have a question for you about roles, though, in, in leaders. Why do CIOs have so much problem with, with sales leaders and marketing leaders? Oh, that's a great question. You know, uh, I... <laughs> I don't know if they have a, is it a problem or have they um, struggled to develop relationships with them? It's, is it is a little bit more work for them to understand their world? And I think, again, it goes back to our roots, right? We were asked to build ROI uh, in how we're using technology. And, you know, it's easier to look at an existing system and say, here's, I'm going to find cost and take cost out of stuff, something. And that's where we found our ROI. And for generations, report, we reported to CFOs. So by definition, we understood those worlds. Sure. Mar marketing has evolved significantly over the last 20 years. Um, it's a series of automation, highly scalable experiments. You know, it's the, back point. To the, it's the <laughs> data world. It is right? the data world. You're right. You're so right with that. Yes. It, it's, it's the data world. And you know, on the opposite extreme, you know, so much of sales resisted quantifying their world, right? You know, they used, they wanted to quantify, you know, what's the number I got to hit, do it once, and then come back and negotiate six months later when they knew they're going to miss their number, right? <laughs> and that, you know, and, and CIOs don't understand that world either, right? It, you know, we're terrible at making commitments over what we're going to deliver three, six, 12 months out. CI, CEOs hate us for that because we know there's so much uncertainty in what we're signing up for that we're timid around it. Um, so I, you know, I think it really does come back to answer your question. Our roots, we reported to CFOs, we were asked for ROI. Um, and now we're flipping the equation and saying, look, if I can't transform the organization just by finding cost. Yeah, the, right. the numbers right. won't add up. I talk about that in both of my books. I need to be partnering on the growth side. I need to be partnering on where technology is going to have uh, an, an impact on customer experience or dramatically change how employees are working day to day. It's a completely different set of equations. And asking ROI is actually the wrong question. I've, I've written about that too. Right? Do you We're have a question? To do you have a question that you think would be a great one to ask um, for any new CIOs that are, you know, just maybe getting in? They're like, you know, if I have a meeting with with the business, with the uh, VP of sales or VP of marketing, what's they can come in and ask a really powerful question. Yeah. What's what's you know, what are your assumptions built into your growth model? What are you trying to sell? You know, what are the unknowns? And being able to for you to be able to hit those numbers. What are your risks and pain points? You know, risks and pain points are usually going to find ways to use technology to uh, remove those barriers. Sometimes it's, you know, automation, sometimes it's communication tools. But when I hear about like, what, what, what can't they sell well today? 
well, you know, maybe it's because I'm not manufacturing something with IoT capabilities the same way my my competitors are doing. You know, uh, I, I talk to hospitals and they're like, you know, they don't necessarily think of themselves as competitors, but they do think of themselves as where's the best place to go for care sure, in my sure. regional area. So that, you know, okay, well, if they have a reputation, they, they have a brand, they have a brand, they have a reputation, the certain services that they want to be known for because they they're better at it or they're more profitable at doing it. Right. And now the question is, well, how does technology help you do this? Well, maybe when I come into the hospital, there's a clean way for me to share my personal information to get better care. How do we do that today? Right. How do we experiment with that? You know, maybe I'm going to put a virtual assistant inside the, sure. the, the hospital room. So my nurses are happier. They're getting their work done a little bit easier. And my retention is going up because they're missing. They're not having a pain point of having to run back and get equipment or get something that, that, that's something that somebody else could do for them. So there's a lot of ways yeah. to use technology, right? When you understand what the problem is. You're just you know, from a mindset, you're just aligning more to the offense side of the equation because you can only squeeze so much costs out of the business. So you got to find ways to al align yourself with the, with the offense of the business. It's actually a great question um, built into that. Um, I'm going to align myself with the offense. I think if you're going to be a CIO driving transformation, you've got to align yourself with the offense. And part of the reason is I know I can get help on the defensive side, right? I know I can get a head of operations who's going to help me, do cloud migrations with the right security in place, with the right automation in place. You know, if we don't get the cost picture right in the first run of it, they're going to find ways to optimize it. You know, that's going to be my expectation of the person in that job, right? I'm not going to be the security expert in solutioning, right? Um, right. right? I'm going to be the one saying, I think we have a problem over here that we need to bring our CISO in to weigh in on what's the best way to go resolve this type of problem. Right. So, you know, I talk about lieutenants and finding digital trailblazers. You know, I think those digital trailblazers need to understand the business, but I'm going to get help from other people who are experts in those areas. I'm going to spend more of my time, again, that 40 to 70 percent going out to customers, going out to sales and marketing, sure. and figuring out where can I provide value to you? Yeah, because you can't outsource that. There's no way you can outsource that. Or that's even, the job. You know, Honestly, yeah, that's that, that is the job. Well, look, uh, Isaac, is there, as we wrap up today, is there one thing that you thought, you know what, I wish Bill would ask me this, but it's something that, uh, that gets asked to you all the time. And I just forgot to ask you, but is there anything that pops in your head that you want to kind of leave our, our conversation and listeners with? Yeah, I, I, here's what I would say. I hear this both from teams, I hear it from CEOs, and I hear it from um, boards, right? When are we going to be done with this? They say it in, in sort of like a fatigued way, right? <laughs> not because they don't believe that there's not going to be more investment needed, but they're just tired of all the effort of doing two jobs, right? You got to run today's business, transform with what you're executing today, and then think about the next horizon every single day. You're planning, you're delivering, and you're transforming. And so, uh, you know, it was common for CIOs to say, uh, as an answer to that is digital transformation is a journey. Well, I, I found that very unsatisfactory, <laughs> right? It's sort of like I'm wandering through the desert and maybe yeah. I'll find something of value and, you know, you know, then we'll feel better about it. I, I tell CEOs and teams, I said, look, I truly believe this is a core competency. Um, this is something that organizations that want to be around 10, 20 years are going to figure out how to use agile outside of IT. Right. They're going to think about bringing data capabilities into the organization with citizen data science, but also figure out how to implement data governance in parallel to that. Just to share a couple of examples around that. Um, I think it's a core competency. I think that's what the best organizations think about it is. And then that comes back to what, what are the practices and most importantly, the type of people that we're hiring, that we're training, that we're learning to be able to do this with us. And you could see that just in the last two years, right? I told uh, CIOs um, in 2022, I said, the last time you've done a real strategic exercise was in 2019. You put out a digital transformation strategy in 2019. And then in 20, you had to rewrite it because That's of right, the pandemic. Right. 
right? And we went into a whole set of other areas and that carried on to 21 and that carried on to 22. And all of a sudden we're dealing with supply chain, we're dealing with inflation, we're dealing with unrest in different areas of the world. And now we're writing that that uh, playbook a year ago based on those three factors. I think 2023 now we're gonna be rewriting another set of factors because of generative AI, right? Yeah. We'll always be transforming. That means transformation needs to be a core competency. People ask me, what do I do now in my third generation? It's exactly that. I help organizations with digital transformation, make it an organization competency. I do that for my writing and speaking in my books. I, give away a ton out of this, um, but I help leaders with their journeys around these areas. Yeah, it's a core competency. I love that that message. And and for those of you who are also interested in how ideas and how to take care of yourself while you're uh, going through this process, you have a whole set of suggestions at the end. Um, yeah, how to do that, which there's 50 lessons learned in the book. Um, they're cataloged at the end. So if you didn't understand my story and say, well, why is Isaac talking about taking walks? Yeah. Right. You know, and 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 going for noodle soups. Well, that was my way with dealing with the stress. And uh, it's one of the things I talk a lot about, particularly at CIO levels. This stuff isn't easy. It's it's real freaking hard. Okay. It's hard. Your job is really hard. Okay. And um, I, I have a blog post out there from a number of years ago where I talk about mementos on my desk. And one is a bottle of beer and one is a small bottle of wine. And every CIO who's ever put out a system knows somewhere after there's going to be the business celebration that we finished something, which is not really finished. But we're having that celebration, we accomplish something. The CIO and the team are still in the back dealing with incidents uh, and issues coming up from that system because they're never perfect. So you never get to drink the beer with the team. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, for those of you listening, I'm, there's going to be on the show notes page and or on the app, if you're listening to this, like on iTunes or Stitcher or YouTube, there'll be a link to um, buy the Digital Tra Trailblazer book, also a link to, to Isaac, so you can connect with him on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, would you prefer people connect with you on LinkedIn or is there a method Ooh. that... LinkedIn, uh, there's email. places on my blog, uh, NY Ike on Twitter. Um, I will tell you... Um, I'll send you the link so it goes in there. But uh, the best way to keep up with all my writing is through my newsletter. My newsletter is basically, here are the 10 to 12 articles and why they're important that I published this week. And they're spread out all over the place. So that's the best way to really stay in touch because there's places in there to throw questions at me. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I'll make sure everybody has access to that. Isaac, this has been a pleasure. Uh, Thank it's you. It's been, been a lot of fun and a lot of, a lot of value to our listeners. So I appreciate that. Thank you.